Good morning. I'd like to welcome each one of you here. We're glad that God has gathered you here to this place. Uh, a couple announcements before we begin. begin. Just uh, things to be aware of. Uh, the church got a note in the mail this past week from Taylor Rosa sharing her appreciation and thanks for those who have supported her mission work in China and saying that she's preparing for ministry in Thailand. And she shared a couple pictures, and I don't know how we're going to get those out or what we're going to do. I slid them in Kathy's mailbox. But um, she said pictures from Wuhan and Bangkok. So apparently she was in Wuhan at least before some point around this time. But we're thankful for God protecting her and continuing to minister through her. And also, uh, a prayer request. You may have seen it on the website, but Jana Rosendahl has a sister, um, Judy, from Illinois, who got diagnosed with stage 3 cancer, a tumor lodged between her heart and lungs. And she's now in the hospital in Iowa City going into chemotherapy. But she was her mom's primary caregiver. And so now Jana is going to be her mom's primary caregiver and moving her mom to Iowa and having lots of decisions to make about uh, life in the coming time. So please be praying for Jana's sister Judy and for Dale and Jana as they figure out uh, life with her mom and how to care for her mom best in these coming weeks. Let's take a moment of silent prayer to prepare our hearts and enter into this time of worship. Let us pray. invite you to rise for our call to worship. Psalm 95, verses 6 and 7. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. For He is our God, and we are His people. The sheep of His pasture, the flock under his care. And our opening hymn is one that reflects on the lengths our shepherd went to care for us, his sheep. Number 482, Man of Sorrows. What a name. 482.
our Savior greets us here this morning. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide in your hearts. Amen. You may be seated. I invite you to turn in the back of the gray hymnal, page 983. We're going to be celebrating the Lord's Supper next week, Sunday. And just if you're wondering, um, we're going to have the elders carry trays with the bread on it. And the bread will be spaced out. And they're going to go in between the pews and you can take off your own piece of bread. And it won't be touching any other pieces of bread. And the, the cup will also be spaced out every other so that you can take your own the same that way with the, the elders walking back and forth between the pews to serve. So just letting you know that ahead of time. Well, we'll start at the top of page 983. Beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ, listen to the words of institution of the Holy Supper of our Lord as they've been handed down by the Apostle Paul. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man not to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord, eats and drinks judgment on himself. In obedience to these words and in fellowship with the church universal, we shall commemorate the death of our Savior in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper on the coming Lord's Day. However, to do so to our comfort, we must first examine ourselves, as the Apostle has admonished. Let all of us, therefore, consider our sin and guilt. God's anger against sin is so great that he punished it in his beloved Son with the bitter and shameful death of the cross. And let us examine whether our hearts accordingly are filled with that godly grief which produces a repentance that leads to salvation. Let us also search our hearts to see whether we truly believe in Jesus Christ as our only Savior and accept God's gracious promise that for the sake of the passion and death of Christ, all our sins are now forgiven. And we are clothed with the perfect righteousness of the Son of God. Finally, let us examine our consciences to see whether we resolve sincerely and gratefully to serve Jesus Christ as Lord and to live by his commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. As we thus examine ourselves, let us be assured that God will certainly receive in grace and welcome to the table of his Son all who repent and walk in faith. However, the Lord admonishes those who do not believe or who have not repented to abstain from the Holy Supper so as not to eat and drink judgment on themselves. Therefore, we also charge those who willfully continue in their sins to keep themselves from the table of the Lord, such as all who trust in any form of superstition, to 
all who honor images or pray to saints, to all who despise God's word or the holy sacraments, all who take God's name in vain, all who violate the sanctity of the Lord's day, all who are disobedient to those in authority over them, all drunkards, gamblers, murderers, thieves, adulterers, liars, and unchaste persons. To all such we say in the name of the Lord, that as long as they remain unrepentant and unbelieving, they have no part in the kingdom of God. However, this solemn warning is not intended, beloved, in the Lord, to discourage the contrite believer. For we do not come to this supper claiming any merit in ourselves. On the contrary, we come testifying that we seek our salvation apart from ourselves in Jesus Christ. By this testimony, we humbly confess that we are full of sin and worthy of death. By this testimony, we also confess that we believe the sure promise of God. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. This promise assures us that no sin or weakness which still remains in us against our will can hinder us from being received by God in grace at his table as worthy partakers of this holy food and drink. Thus assured, let us at the appointed hour come with quiet conscience and fullness of faith to keep this sacramental feast which our Lord appointed to be a continual memorial of his atoning death until he comes. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Father, by whose law all are tried and by whose gospel we have hope. We, your servants, look to you for help in examining ourselves. In your grace, you invite us to the table of your Son. We confess that we have sinned. Have compassion on us in our weakness. Enable us in the light of your holy word to read the secrets of our own hearts and to recognize the fruits of your work of grace within us. Strengthen us by your Holy Spirit so that we may obediently respond to your call in sincere repentance and true faith. Graciously remove whatever in us might keep us from your table. Let no love of sin or untruth, no pride or lust, no hatred or envy toward our neighbor, no remnant of unbelief remain within us to keep us from responding gladly. By your Spirit, assemble us at the appointed hour to commemorate in an unbroken bond of Christian fellowship the atoning death of our Savior. Hear us, we pray, in the name of our ever-living intercessor, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit belong all praise and glory, now and forever. Amen. I invite you to turn to 487. We can examine ourselves without despair because of the sweet name of Jesus. 487.
invite you to turn to Psalm 86. Psalm 86. As was, we continue looking at these select psalms as songs and prayers for the journey of discipleship, the journey of faith through this life. Last week, we looked at Psalm 3 and how David was given sleep in the presence of his enemies. And we reflected on our lives lived between the knowledge of our God as king and the enemies surrounding us. And Psalm 86 is another plea for help. Another psalm dealing with troubles in this world. Before we read, let us pray. God Almighty, the disciples came to Jesus and said, Lord, teach us to pray. And as we come to the Psalter, as we look at Psalm 86, Lord, we pray, teach us to pray. We pray that you would help us to see you more clearly, to know you more truly, to love you more deeply, and therefore live for you, serve you more wholeheartedly. May the meditations of my mouth and the words of your servant's lips be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Psalm 86, a prayer of David. Hear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Guard my life, for I am devoted to you. You are my God. Save your servant who trusts in you. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I call to you all day long. Bring joy to your servant, for to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. You are forgiving and good, O Lord, abounding in love to all who call to you. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Listen to my cry for mercy. In the day of my trouble, I will call to you, for you will answer me. Among the gods, there is none like you, O Lord. No deeds can compare with yours. All the nations you have made will come and worship before you, O Lord. They will bring glory to your name. For you are great and do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord. And I will walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. I will praise you, O Lord my God, with all my heart. I will glorify your name forever. For great is your love toward me. You have delivered me from the depths of the grave. The arrogant are attacking me, O God. A band of ruthless men seeks my life. Men without regard for you. But you, O Lord, are a compassionate and gracious God. Slow to anger. And abounding in love and faithfulness. Turn to me. And have mercy on me. Grant your servant Grant your strength to your servant and save the son of your maidservant. 
Give me a sign of your goodness that my enemies may see it and be put to shame. For you, O Lord, have helped me and comforted me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So one of the memories I have of my grandpa in the last three years of his life, that was Grandma died three years before Grandpa did. And one of the memories I had of Grandpa in his house, because Grandpa loved to play the organ. And he would sit at the organ in his house and he'd just play. Except for in those last three years, he, he moved away from the organ and he had a, a really nice electric keyboard that he could get to sound like an organ. He moved it to a picture window he had. Looking out over a pond where he could see the birds over the water. He could look out over the farm and see the cows in the pasture. And he would sit at this um, keyboard. And he told me that his devotions had come to be kind of like jazz, he said. He'd take the hymnal and open it to a hymn. And he would reflect on those words musically. He would just play it over and over, changing the tone and the key and the stops. And he would just take those familiar words and explore them. And we know that from our organists or our musicians that they can bring a piece of music that's very familiar to life, emphasizing it in different ways, bringing our hearts up or, or making us more introspective with a minor key. The words are the same, but they affect us differently. Now what I want to tell you is that prayer is a little bit like that. A little bit like jazz where they take the same familiar chords and they rearrange them to, to fit the mood. To get across the current state of the soul. Now as you listen to Psalm 86, if, if you have read the Psalms lots, you will have reflected certain phrases that aren't new. They're not original ideas. They're, so to speak, the basic chords of the Psalms. I'm poor and needy. You hear that phrase repeated throughout the Psalms. Guard my life. You hear that repeated through the Psalms. I'm your servant. You're my Lord. Teach me your ways. That's almost a direct quote from Psalm 27 verse 11. And it reflects on Psalm 119, verses 10 and 11. But what I want you to take away and to realize is that our prayers can be incredibly personal and rich using old, familiar words. You don't have to make up something from scratch for your prayer life. But rather, as you read the Psalms, as you read Scripture, you will find as you sit down to pray that the Holy Spirit will draw phrases from here and from there and combine them. That you might come to God and speak to God, pray to God, God's own words back to Him. And find your heart ministered to, comforted, strengthened for the life of discipleship. Sometimes we, we pray the same words and they, they come at us from a different point. If you've read through the Bible any amount, if you read any portion more than once, you will find that Something different strikes you each time. 
because we are at a different point in life. And we need to hear a different word from the Lord. And he gives that to us. And here in Psalm 86, David prays. Taking these stock phrases from the Israelite faith. To deal with this situation of trouble that he faces. As he pleads with God to guard his life. That request comes in verse 2. And we don't find out what he needs guarding from. We don't find out what his troubles are until we get to verse 14. Of 17 in the psalm. The way David starts his prayer is a a little bit different than the way we normally would. I mean, when we normally pray and we have a trouble, we address God. We may say, Abba, Father, help! And then we'll tell him what the issue is. Cancer. Financial trouble. Family relation troubles. God, help! But I want us to look closely at the way David prays here. That we might grow in our prayers. Now look at the first thing David grounds his prayer in. in verses 1 through 4. Notice what David emphasizes. He emphasizes his need there in verse 1 and the first part of 2. I am poor and needy, guard my life. But then right away, he focuses on the relationship he has with God. I'm devoted to you. You are my God. Save your servant who trusts in you. Have mercy on me, O God, for I call to you all day long. Bring joy to your servant. For to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. David starts his prayer by emphasizing his connection to God. His relationship with his covenant God. Now, Think about talking with someone, communicating with someone. The less you know that person, the less you're going to share with them, right? The better you know that person, the more intimate your relationship with them, the more you know you can talk to them. The more you know you can bear your heart. the more you know they care for you. And David starts by emphasizing this relationship with his God. And note the relationship he he emphasizes. You are my God, save your servant. And then have mercy on me, O Lord. And note it's not the all capitals, Remember, when you see Lord in all capitals, like in verse 1 and verse 6, that's I am, or the name God gave to Moses in Exodus chapter 3, Yahweh, the covenant name of God. But here when David says Lord with the lowercase, he's saying Adonai, Master, my ruler. He's emphasizing that I am your servant, my master. Now, that's a relationship that has responsibilities both ways. Servants are supposed to obey their masters, but good masters care for their servants, provide for their servants, protect their servants. It's a relationship with covenant obligations in both directions. 
And so by emphasizing, I'm devoted to you, I call out to you, I look to you, David is saying, God, I'm in a relationship with you. Help me because I am yours. Now, David's not saying he's perfect here. No, just note in verse 3, he says, have mercy. And then in verse 5, he talks about forgiving. David's acknowledging that he's a sinner, if in the margins. But he's emphasizing that this sinner has a relationship with this merciful and forgiving God. That is the ground he starts his prayer. This relationship with God. And then note where he moves in verses 5 through 7. What does he talk about now? He talks about the character of God. You are forgiving, good, abounding in love to all who call on you. You will Answer me. Verse 7. Just as the more intimate relationship we have with someone, the more we are willing to open up to them, the more we know that someone's character is good and noble and right, the more we trust them. The more we're willing to, to ask for help and know that they will do what is right. And so David starts by reminding himself, by praying it, of what's God's character. Now this, you are forgiving and good, abounding in love, that reflects the same language he repeats down in verse 15. Compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in love. Now here's a trivia question. What is the most referenced verse within the Old Testament? Just within the Old Testament. It's from Exodus chapter 34. And it's actually verses 6 and 7. This is when God passed in front of Moses. Proclaiming the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God. Slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. And it continues there talking about punishing the wicked, but those parts I read are the most referred back to. In the Old Testament, the prophets pull it back. We see it constantly in the Psalms, just like David references here in Psalm 86. It refers back to the character of God. Why do we, imperfect sinners, dare to come to God with our need? Because we know the character He has revealed to us. Compassionate and gracious forgiving and merciful. And we know this even better than David did, for we know Jesus Christ and the lengths He went to save us. Dying on the cross while we were yet sinners. David's prayer is grounded in his relationship Strengthened by the character of God. And then he moves on in verses 8 through 10. To ground his prayer in the supremacy of God. Why on earth would you pray to anyone else? Is a simple way to paraphrase what David says. Whom else have I to go? Among the gods? There's no one like you. Because they aren't gods, David is saying. All the nations are going to come and worship you. Every knee will bow, whether they want to or not. 
They will bring glory to your name because you alone are God. We need to remind ourselves of why do we pray? And specifically, why do we pray to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? It's because nobody else can help us. And because of our relationship and the character of God, we don't have to go through someone else to pray to God. You don't have to come to your pastor or someone who who is more saintly than you to pray on your behalf to God. But because of Jesus Christ and your faith in him, you may directly approach the throne of your covenant God who is compassionate and gracious. So be encouraged, brothers and sisters. Our prayer is grounded in the fact that God is God and there is no other. Or as Jesus said, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. And I will be with you always. Look where David grounds his prayer again, where he moves next in verses 11 through 13. He grounds it in God's praise. Teach me your way, O Lord. Why? And I will walk in your truth. Why are we supposed to walk in God's truth? What is the purpose of that? Well, we're made in God's image. We're made to reflect his splendor, his glory to those around us in creation. The purpose of God redeeming us, justifying us, sanctifying us, is to let others see Jesus through us and praise God because of what they see in us. Not praise us, but praise God because of what they see in us. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. You cannot worship two masters. You cannot serve both God and money, as Jesus put it. We're so tempted to be double-minded. And David reminds us to pray that God would give us focus on Jesus. That we would desire that whatever happens, God would be praised in us and through us. That though we pray like Paul, that God would remove this thorn. And he never does. He would be praised through that. And then finally, David moves in verses 14 through 17 to his situation, to his need for help. But his prayer, you could say, is grounded in God's perspective of his troubles. The arrogant are attacking me, O God. A band of miserable or ruthless men seeks my life. Men without regard for you. And he sets the ruthless band of men... The arrogant opposing him, he sets that right next to that profession of faith from Exodus 34. You are a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. When we walk through our lives, we need to put on the lens of faith. So that we see God first and then see our troubles. So to speak, put God closer to us than our troubles are. 
We need to see our, our troubles through, the, through God, not God through our troubles. Because if we look at our troubles first, that's going to warp the way we view God. But like David here, we need to remember our relationship with God, His character, His supremacy, the purpose of our lives to praise Him. And say, help. And in doing so, David reminds us that God is greater than our troubles. That no matter what our troubles, God is capable of turning them to good. Just as he did on the cross of Jesus Christ. And even the answer to his prayer. He he doesn't see it yet. But note how he talks about it in that last verse. He prays, give me a sign of your goodness that my enemies may see it and be put to shame. For you, O Lord, have helped me and comforted me. This is what you could call the prophetic past tense. David's prayer is not answered yet. But David is so confident that God will answer his prayer and provide what he needs in the midst of his troubles that he speaks of it is already done. Oh Lord, you have helped me and comforted me. And we can pray that even more concretely than David did. Because in Christ we are already guaranteed forgiveness and the resurrection from the dead. We are guaranteed that God will never let us go. We are promised that Christ has gone ahead to prepare a place for us. And if he's gone to prepare a place for us, he will come back and take us to be there with him. And so whatever situation you are facing right now, whatever burdens, large or small, whatever trials, whatever joys, ground your prayers in God, as David does here, in order that you might have hope no matter what your circumstances, or how they turn out in this world. Brothers and sisters in Christ, if we've died in Christ, we too will be raised with Him. And we have that to look forward to. May it give you strength for your Christian walk today. Let us pray. God Almighty, I pray that each one of us here would put our faith in Jesus Christ and discover the wonders of being in a covenant relationship with a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. I pray that each one of us would find hope and courage to pray. And then to live. Because we are strengthened by you in our prayers. God Almighty, we pray that you would help us to remember to put our troubles in the light of our God. And not view you, our God, in light of our troubles. For you, Lord God, are greater than our troubles. We thank you for this. Guide and direct us in these coming days. That we might live faithfully, prayerfully for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Our song of response is number 554.
or 544, sorry, 544, lead me, guide me along the way. 544. God in prayer. Lord of all creation, you spoke and the world came into being. Light and darkness, sky and earth, land and water, plants, birds, fish, and animals. 
and you made us in your image. What is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him? Yet you made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. God Almighty, you put everything under our feet, giving us stewardship under you of all creation. God Almighty, help us to remember that we are tenant farmers in your world. Using the gifts and the talents and the resources that you provide for our benefit, for your glory and praise. Help us to use them wisely. Whether we are cultivating our minds and our bodies, whether we are using gifts to build and do finances, to farm or health care, to teach to preach. God Almighty, we pray that through us the world might see a glimpse of the power of your grace to transform sinners. God our Father, we thank you for the freedoms that we enjoy, for this good land we live in. Lord, we grieve with the sin we see around us, the disrespect for authorities, the, the disrespectable behavior of authorities, our politicians. We pray that you would help us to honor those authorities that you have instituted in this land. And to teach others to honor them as well, whether police officers or government leaders. And we pray for those Christians who serve as government leaders, that they might model a godly desire to serve the people they represent, a godly desire to testify to your truth and to shape the laws of this land more and more in line with your truth. Lord, help us to work with hope and yet also to remember that our only hope of making all things new as the way they are supposed to be is Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, who will make all things new. God, our Father, we pray for your church. We pray for your church in India. With the nationalist Hinduism that's rising and oppressing your people. We pray that you would protect your church, that you would encourage them as they seek to share the good news of the gospel. To provide hope for the hopeless. And we thank you for the way your church is growing. In particular, among the outcasts of that nation, among the powerless and the weak. Lord, protect and encourage them, build them up, and provide them pastors and elders and deacons to care and shepherd for them, shepherd them. We pray that you would protect them from persecutors. We pray that you would uh, thwart the plans, the schemes of the evil one. That you would break the teeth of the wicked, stopping their mouths. And Lord, that like Paul, you would knock them on their backside and open their eyes to see you as Lord and Savior, transforming them from enemies into friends of the gospel, disciples of Jesus. God, our Father, we pray for our congregation. We pray for those dealing with cancer. Teresa Rosenboom. Marion Terpstra. 
Jana Rosendahl's sister Judy. We pray for those caring for failing, declining parents or spouses. Lord, encourage both parties. Those who are seeing their abilities decline, their health decline, but also those who are watching their loved ones decline. Lord, through it all, may we remember to curse sin and not the people or you. Help us to remember to be frustrated that this world is not the way it's supposed to be and to long for the day when you make all things new. God Almighty, help us to remember that you are the only one who can. And that the way you choose to make all things new is through the word of God going out to all nations. Heavenly Father, we take an offering today for the Bible lead. We pray that the work of this ministry would get the word out. That the world may know Jesus Christ as Savior. And the hope that we have in him. We pray all this in Jesus' precious name and God's people said. Amen. So, on our way out, our offering is for the Bible League. Our sung call to discipleship is number 488. I heard the voice of Jesus say, 488. Elders aren't going to be dismissing you pew by pew this time. Um, you're responsible and you can dismiss yourselves. Feel free to visit in the pew and slow the rush out. But we encourage you to, to visit outside. Uh, I don't think we're going to have refreshments today because we weren't sure if there were going to be showers or not when church was starting. But um, as we go out from here, we go not in our own strength but we go with God's powerful blessing. May God go before you to guide you. May God go behind you to defend you. May God go beneath you to support you. And may God go beside you to befriend you. 
May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and fill you with his peace in Christ. Amen.